Hi, everybody, and welcome back to On the Roof. Today we have with us uh, Janelle Marie Pierce, and she is... Hello, Janelle. Hello. Janelle is the executive director of the STD Project, as well as the spokesperson for Positive Singles. Now, let's get right into this, Janelle. This is... Uh, wh what are these... Um, I, I think they speak for themselves but maybe you could just clarify for anybody that might not get it. What, what is, are like, STDs? Yeah, what are, no, what are the two uh, positions? Like, what do you, you know, what are oh, they about? Sure. What is the STD sure. project and what is Positive Singles? Sure, yeah. So the STD project is primarily a website. We also have a podcast and a YouTube channel, and then we do a lot of writing on external websites and things um, based on awareness, education, and acceptance um, for STIs and STDs, sexually transmitted infections and diseases. Um, we have like the basic factual information about how you can contract them, symptoms and testing. But then we also cover what I like to call the gray area where we talk about people's personal stories, what it's like to live with an STI, dating with an STI, disclosure, conversation, prevention, um, a lot of different facets that aren't regularly talked about and especially not in an open fashion. We do right. ST, STD interviews. So we interview people who have STDs and I talk about my experience. I'm living with an STD. And so as a result of that work, that started and launched seven years ago. I quit my job, my corporate really lucrative job and decided that this is what I wanted to do full time. Um, and it's been seven years and in that process, then Positive Singles, which is a dating site for people with STIs, reached out to me and asked if I would be willing to represent them and speak on their behalf for media and press and things. So I am their spokesperson um, as a result of that work. So that's basically now my whole life. I'm like the STD whisperer, essentially. <laughs> That, that's actually very funny, huh? <laughs> or is it just me? Um, I think it's I think it's entertaining. I it mean, is. I'm like, hey, it if is. you can't be famous, you might as well be infamous, right? <laughs> well, you, you, listen, I really give you a lot of credit for for being upfront and 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 right out there with this. It re anything like the uh, something that has a stigma attached to it is just so hard, and it, and people get stuck. With anything, but you know, we'll we'll stay specifically on on your your things, but and that whole getting stuck is really all about like the emotional stuff that comes with the actual condition, you know, the shame or you know, and and it gets if you can't talk about it, you know, in recovery we say if you talk about it, it cuts the problem in half just by sharing it once, you know, mm -hmm. that, that that's pretty good. Right it's there. so true. Oh, that that applies one hundred percent to STIs. Like, yeah, the actual people are like mortified, petrified of contracting an infection because there's so much shame associated with it. There's so right. much fear, shame, and stigma. And the thing is, is the actual infection itself is usually pretty benign. If you have any symptoms at all, oftentimes they're really mild or manageable. or like, they're not a big deal for the majority of people. So the actual infection and like the the physical symptoms and things is kind of no big deal. Yes, you nobody wants an infection, I get it. I don't want a cold or the flu, the sniffles. I don't want any sort of issue with my health, but these things happen. But, the, but what's so hard about it is the trauma associated with it because of the cultural shaming and stigma around sex and having an STI and what that means if you have a negative consequence or a not so desirable consequence as a result of sex. And, and we're already, culturally, we're already so Puritan stigmatized about sex in general. And then you add that, add that extra layer of an STI and people just freak out. And it's just like you get lost. Just what sex in, in America needs. Hard. More shame. Infection. Most infections are either curable or treatable. It's the shame. Exactly. Exactly. So, you know, um, and it, please uh, forgive me for my ignorance uh, to a certain point on this, uh, but what are the ones that, like, I, I would assume, obviously, HIV are the ones that are not benign? Like, well, how do you know if, if something was, you know, real serious and, and you were in danger of, you know, 
infecting somebody else or, or passing something on or, or just not maybe addressing it for yourself and it just getting really, you know, really bad, you know, health wise, your own personal health or whatever. I mean, that's a normal question that I get asked all the time. Like, what are the worst STDs? Like, what's the worst thing you can have? Or what really, what are the bad ones? And actually, even HIV um, is treatable and manageable and now. preventable. You know, now. exactly. So that's changed a lot, leaps and bounds. Um, in terms of accessibility and for treatment and care and things like that, like that's not equitable across the board. However, if we're just talking just base level, what is out there? Like, yeah, absolutely. You can totally live a long life. You can not transmit it to people. Like it does not have to be a death sentence um, if you have access to care and things like that. And so same deal. Actually, a lot of infections. It's funny. I just wrote part of my work for the STD project is I write for a lot of sites, like I said, and Pornhub has a sexual wellness center. And so I write for their sexual wellness center. And I just wrote an article today how um, the there are so many infections that are curable, but most people don't get any signs and symptoms. Like the most common symptom of all STIs is zero symptom, is no symptom whatsoever. So is not having a symptom. So people make the assumption and just have this idea in their mind, this misconception that they'll know if somebody they are dating has an STI, if somebody they're having sexual activity, enjoying sexual activity with, they'll know. Or they'll know if they have an STI. And the reality is you actually probably won't know because most people don't have signs and symptoms. So things that are really not, not a big deal, especially not a big deal, like absolutely curable, like you won't even live with them for life, like chlamydia, bacterial infections, gonorrhea, trichomoniasis, mycoplasma, genitalia. Um, there's like all of these infections that are curable, but if you don't get them cured, they actually can cause really big issues like infertility. 15% of all infertility cases are a result of an untreated STI something that was curable and could have totally been eliminated, but people didn't know they had it, they're not getting tested, they think, oh, I'll know if I have an infection. And so then they end up not, they, they're infertile, they're not able to have children because of something that was totally preventable and curable. And that's the shame about it, because it's like if we made, if this conversation were happening more regularly between our friends and family and our loved ones and just culturally, societal-wise, there, people would not be so afraid about the outcome and getting tested and doing this preventative and just being practical about their sexual health and stuff. But it's like people are totally afraid of getting tested, totally afraid of having a positive outcome. So they'd rather just not know, you know, well, why like, would somebody get tested if there's no symptoms? I mean, that just doesn't, it's not like that defies logic. There's no symptoms. I'm good. That's, that's the assumption, but you'd get tested because you put yourself at risk. So anyone who's sexually active is at a risk of contracting an infection. All activities contain some level of risk and not in a way of like everybody should be freaked out and scared, but it's like everything we do in life has risk, but there's reward to those risks. So it's, I think, especially when you're talking about sex and sexual health and things, people are like, oh my God gosh, this is the worst thing that could possibly ever happen. And you don't want an unplanned pregnancy and you definitely don't want an STI. Every activity you do with a partner has some level of risk. So naturally then you, or at least you'd think that naturally then we'd say, okay, well, let's do some preventative, like let's get tested on a regular basis because we're being sexually active. And so we just want to be responsible and thoughtful and we want to catch anything. How would somebody it go about that? I mean, that's like an awkward conversation, isn't it? You mean asking a partner to get tested or just going and getting tested yourself? Uh, no, both, but I was both. saying about asking, but I think both might be, you know. Yeah, well. I mean, it's an easy thing people. to want to just avoid, right? Oh, for sure, because yeah. the idea of having to go into a clinic and having somebody, especially if you're going into like an STD-specific clinic, now it. people feel shameful about it. Like, oh, if I'm going to a clinic, that must mean I'm having like too much sex or, or the wrong kind of sex or risky sex, which all sex is risky. So I'm not really sure why we think that. It doesn't make a lot of practical, logical sense, but it's just the way culturally. But, it, but there is a, there's a hierarchy of you know, more risky and less risky. Yes. Oh, that's true. Yeah. Okay. So certain activities are more risky than others. So like in an order from least to most risky is like manual sex, like hand jobs and um, fingering. Anything with your hands is manual sex, then oral sex. So anything with your mouth, whether you're the giver or the receiver, and then there's some like different nuance and scale there, but we won't go into that much detail because that can get really boring. And then it's penetrative vaginal sex. So um, penis and vagina, and then it's anal sex. So, so anal sex would be the most risky, not because it's bad or wrong or gross or there's something bad about it. It's just because of our body, our physiolo physiology. So right. there's like 
it has to do with mucous membranes and natural lubrication and things like that. So there's factors that make things more risky and whether or not there may be blood or bodily fluids or skin to skin connection and things like that. So, but if you're just wanting to simplify it, manual, oral, vaginal, penis and vagina, and then anal. But wouldn't you say that it's the shame and the um, judgment that is the, basically the culprit like that's the, that's where the big disconnect is. It's because of the judgment that comes with it and the shame that comes with it that people don't want to have the conversation and people don't want to talk about it. They don't want to get tested. They don't want to have that conversation with their partner. You know, all, all of it. Wouldn't it be shame oh, and judgment? Far. Shame and judgment, one hundred percent. Because everyone has an opinion about what kind of sex you should be having with whom and how and where. You know, opinions are like assholes, right? Everyone has them. But yeah, while we're talking about anal, why not? Right, exactly. I'm like full right. circle. But in in some ways, people always use that. Like, what is it that's called the cliche or whatever? I'm horrible at these cliches. However, opinions aren't like assholes because everyone has too many of them. We only have one asshole. Wow. So we have more opinions. Woo. <laughs> See, there's going to be a major takeaway here, despite what goes on from this point. We got a takeaway right there. And this, right. Is what, this is what baffles me, Scott, all the time, because everyone has these multiple opinions about even just one someone's sex life. And it's like, if, it, if it's not you, if nobody's asking you to do those activities, why do you care? What does it matter? I mean, how does it impact you whatsoever? I, I absolutely agree with you a thousand percent on that. It just I just blows don't understand my mind. It. Me neither. I don't get it. I don't, I don't get the judgment. Like... If they're not asking, and even if somebody asks you to do it and you don't want to, you say even like this even comes to like homophobia and stuff like that, you know? Yeah. And like, I've heard that from guy friends of mine, like, oh, they better not hit on me. And I'm like, why? They're asking. And then you can say no. And, and the, it doesn't hurt you at all. There is no harm being done. And somebody else, and then but especially because, that's because a side ignorance, ignorance is ignorance, right? And, and, and ignorance is a big thing when you're in the middle of it. And then when you come in and you explain explain it that way, you 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 know that's real easy to comprehend. And 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 it, with that perspective, it makes a lot of sense. And I think that's that's why these conversations have to be had. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, because right. maybe somebody doesn't have to be in a public setting to have to have that aha moment. Maybe you can get it to them before. You know, they go out and, and there's all kinds of shit that breaks out in the wrong setting because people don't have the information. Right, right. People are, everyone just wants to be normal, to be understood and to belong, I think is one of our like carnal, natural human instincts is we want to belong. And in some ways that makes sense too, because back from when we were hunter gatherers, if you didn't belong, you were likely to die. I mean, you needed to be part of a network. You're going to be gathered. Of- <laughs> yeah. And then when you were talking about our sex lives, everyone wants to know like, okay, well, how does that, how do I compare? And am I on an extreme? And what I like to encourage folks is like, it doesn't matter as long as the, you and your partner or partners are enjoying whatever you're doing and agreeing to it, do whatever the fuck you want to do. And like, it is nobody else's business. And yes, you may be cho- choosing okay. activities that are riskier. You may be choosing, yeah. um, something that puts you more at risk, but that's a choice that you're making and more power to you. You have the right to that. As long as, again, you and your partners are consenting. Right, but, but that's real easy to say now. The conditioning starts when, when everyone's young. And if you got, like, if you're a girl growing up, a behavior that you like gets out and all of a sudden you get ridiculed and, and, and chastised and, and you know, your, your whole experience in life has been altered. There's a lot of teen suicide over stuff like this and, and cyberbullying and all of this stuff. It's not... So, yeah, sure, live and let live. I Listen, it should be. I get it. Yeah. But it's not that But that's not, not that the way. reality. No. I think so much no. of it is all I mean, religious, right. too. You know, so much has to do with oh, religion. so much. I was 16 when I contracted herpes. I have genital herpes, HSV2 specifically. And um, HSV1 can be genitally, too. But anyways, I have genital herpes. I was 16. And at that point in time, like prior in the year or two prior, I was really struggling with I thought I was going to save myself for marriage because my religion had taught me that that was like the most admirable thing I could do, what, that what, virginity what was some idea. Um, I would say Christian, like broadly, you know, nothing in specific. My dad was Catholic. My mom was Protestant. So when we Irish. lived in, 
No, no. Um, didn't sound, Polish, I didn't think so. So we went to a lot of different denominations. Now I'm more spiritual. Right. Um, but I still, I still, um, organized religion is what frustrates me because I'm, organized did, yeah, religion right, is what right told on, me that man, I yeah. should feel awful. That it was the people. Essentially, it was the people. Inherently, people have faults. And so we're trying to put our faults on other people. And what really is interesting, I think, is that when you decide that you're not going to subscribe to that. So like you said, you you made an excellent point. Like it is way easier said than done. And um, even from, okay, even, so let me even go back before I contracted STIs. Um, and I've had multiple, all right? I've had more than just herpes, which who says that out loud, but whatever. So anyways, both, even before that, I started developing at a really young age and I have big boobs and I've always had big boobs. And, and so it was noticed in, in my middle school years and pointed out and rumors went around and it was like, it was traumatic for me at the time. Like it was really awful. And I still remember how I you felt. Mean the, the, the STD? Was there a no, rumor that went out? This was just no, just, just about just my, having big my boobs. body. Yes, just having big that was, breasts. That's not a rumor. You know, well, the rumor was that I stuffed my bra and they weren't oh, real. God. So I know. I'm like, and wow. of all things, I'm like, I don't I didn't put these here. I didn't choose them, you know, and now I'm being stuck with like some stupid rumor. So still silly stuff, but to what you're saying, to your point is like there were there were things along the lines all throughout my teenage years that taught me to feel shameful about my body, my sexuality, um, exploring my sexuality, owning myself, and not and and basically essentially taught me to feel shame all all, all the time about who I was and my natural instincts and desires and interests. So I'm just going to stop. I'm going to stop allowing other people to use it as a way in which to humiliate or characterize me or whatever. And as soon as I did that, it was like this giant, you know, and there's no easy way to, to, to walk folks through how to get there. There's no easy way to say like, this is the process. These are the steps. And I know Scott, you've dealt with this a little bit too, in your journey and process through addiction, but they're in trauma and there's no easy way to tell folks like, here are the steps Yes, there's like the 12 step program and things like that that will help, but everybody goes about it in a different little, a little bit of a different way. And somebody telling you, like, oh, it will get better. And on the other end, it's so amazing. Like, that's so, it's not easy and it's not really that helpful it's when you're fairy in it. Tale. You, 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 you file out with all the other fairy tales. Mm -hmm. Exactly. At the time when you're in it and you're in it, it feels like that's a bunch of bull crap and this is awful and you don't understand and this experience is mortifying and traumatizing and when you're in the trauma you can't you can't see that from that perspective and so um but i think what's beautiful and it's nice to at least know for folks is to say that like when you decide to stop being to stop feeling shame around things that society has told you to be shamed about just like addiction just like stis it's you get very little pushback, but even the pushback that you're getting, like I do get some pushback every once in a while because I'm in this, I'm doing this in such a public way. I get negative comments, but usually those comments are from people who are also experiencing similar things, but they're just angry because you're on the other side of it and they don't know they're, they're still feeling shame and trauma from this right. experience right. and they want other people to be in it too. And so they're almost mad or jealous or there's like an underlying frustrated. resentment towards you. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, but it is, it's freeing. And like you said, at one of the beginning of our conversation, like having the little conversations, you don't have to necessarily be publicly running a podcast like Scott is. You don't have to be running a website like I am talking about your experience 100% open to the entire public, but it's just sharing your story when it applies and as it comes out naturally and organically. And maybe that's just telling yourself and talking to yourself about it in your head. I mean, that's the first step is being able to say, I have herpes and have it not make you cry in the mirror, you know, being able to look at yourself and say, I have an STD or I have an addiction or um, I used to be an addict or I am an addict or however it is you say it and how you identify, you get to choose that though. Nobody else gets to choose that's it for you. That's the point. That is the point. That is so good. I was telling somebody just the other day when they were um, just talking about relationships and stuff and just frustration with the guys that she's been dating and she sets the bar. You know, like I'm saying, this is what you accept is up to you. You, you. you don't accept. I mean, you determine your own value. Mm -hmm. If you yep. if you if you if you just put that out there, 
You've sold yourself short no matter what comes back. Unless, you know, somehow the stars are aligned and everything works out and you, and you meet the knight in shining armor. But this is 2019 and, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, there's a lot of shit going on out there. So that probably, I, I wouldn't roll the dice open for that one. Right. You know, so People set the bar try. yourself. Own your shit. Own it all. Mm -hmm. The good, the bad. Mm -hmm. I think the greatest freedom personally for me is to be able to look back and own every single thing, even every thought, own everything and not define myself by any of it. But I, I, I mean, no matter what it is, own it. I'm right. okay, but I just don't have to be that guy. Like I have well, to do necessary want, things to change. They'll tell but... you you are. People will, people will 100% be like, no, this is who you are as a result of something in your past, something that you've done. But define. And we, but whatever. I mean, in some yeah. ways, it's like, okay, good They're for gone. you. Fuck yeah, that. you can think however you want. Right. You have the right to your own thoughts and opinions, just as I do my own about myself. And, and that's the other thing, too, is it's like we can do bad things, make mistakes. We can have bad feelings, bad experiences. And they can happen even repeatedly, but that doesn't make us bad as a whole. That doesn't make us entirely bad people, you right. know, like one does not equal the other. And I think that people immediately, especially again with STIs, like you get it, you contract an ST and I, ST and I, an STI, and you 100% believe like all of these misconceptions. Well, that must mean I'm dirty, trashy, I'm a whore, I'm damaged goods, I'm tainted, um, no one's going to want me. And that's not true. Like everybody has something that they're not necessarily proud of or that they felt like they could have done better or wish that they could have. But that also helps us to become more empathetic and interesting people. Like it gives us a story to tell. If we were all very basic, doing these normal, perfect, linear lives and paths, I mean, there wouldn't be anything to talk about. We wouldn't have a podcast today. You know, cool. Janelle, this is, I'm, I'm absolutely fascinated with this conversation because you are so cool. I'm just thinking in my um, impressionable years when I was going through things and I didn't want to talk, you know, you hold things in, you know, somebody like you opens that door. You, I mean, somebody like if I heard you back then or somebody like you with, with the issues I had, um, that, that says, Oh, wow. I mean, you know, it, it almost validates what I think is so wrong with me. And then that, then you can start to fix it because I feel comfortable identifying as an addict, you know, or, you know, until then it's just like, no, listen, I'm, you know, you're just, you know, everything's a separate issue. You know, there's, it, it, there's all that, it's all judgment and shame. I really, really, really do think it comes down to that. And they're both fear-based, both of them. And, mm -hmm. and somebody said to me not too long ago either, that every single, everything is either fear or love. Every decision, every, everything you do, everything you do is, is either, is coming from a place of fear or love. Yes. If you break uh, it down. I mean, it's kind of profound because I can't think of an example where I could disagree with that statement. I mean, right. it really very much is. And even like when you make decisions with sexual partners, right? I mean, the, I was on this podcast or not a podcast, a radio show a while ago at Michigan State University. And one of the professors said on the on one of the shows, and we talked about this actually, it became a repeating theme because I felt like it was really relevant and it was something that we all should think about on a regular basis. But he was saying how he always starts his semesters off by asking his students to think about their most recent sexual encounter with a partner, partnered sexual experience, whatever they were doing. It doesn't have to be intercourse. It could just be um, play and whatever, however you want to define it, whatever it was, just a partnered sexual intimate experience. And then ask yourself, why did you engage in that activity? And now he said, the caveat is the intention is not what you might assume, like an abstinence only kind of education and background in safer sex and sexual health always talks about like, oh, you, you don't want to do this because it could have a bad outcome. But he said, actually, very rarely do people ever get asked why they're engaging in sex. And usually when when you ask them, I mean, it takes a moment to think about that. And I mean, and then it never has, it almost very rarely has anything to do with pleasure. And that's where he was going with this. It's usually because I felt like um, I wanted to continue the relationship. I wanted them to like me or want me, or I thought that that was what was the next step. Or, mm. you know, there's so much emotionally and psychologically going on. Is that just because on. of the age group that you're talking to at that time? No, it's any, it's any age group. Um, 
any demographic, if they are asked why they're engaging in sexual activity, very rarely does it come back to pleasure. Very rarely did they say, because I wanted to and because I was going to enjoy it. I was thinking I was going to enjoy it. And the point of it, the point of this question and this in this this line of questioning is that it should be about pleasure. That's something that we're not taught to um, to feel powerful about, to feel empowered about, to wanting and desiring and appreciating and enjoying pleasure, sexual pleasure especially. We're encouraged to experience pleasure, treat yourself all the time and all other facets of life. But when it comes to sex, there's so many, there's so much else going on psychologically and emotionally that we very rarely come back to the whole point of pleasure. And when you strip it down and then come back to actual pleasure, people start to make choices that are truly better for them. Not less sex, not different kinds of sex, not necessarily, just choices that they feel really good about because the goal is to have that pleasure, enjoy that pleasure. And we feel so much shame and stigma around enjoying pleasure, even down to masturbating, right? Not partnered activities, things that don't have risk. People are afraid to admit that they masturbate on a regular basis and that's a totally healthy thing to do. That also helps you to understand things that you like and ways in which that you can can enjoy and can orgasm and can experience pleasure. I mean, it's very much a self-discovery, a release. I mean, there's so many be benefits of actual masturbating. L let me, let and me, we don't talk about that. I mean, how much, of, how much have you grown just sexually? Oh, leaps and bounds. I mean, leaps and bounds. I, I can talk about there's always still a little bit of awkwardness depending on the background and the partner and things like that. But it's so much easier to talk about it and to not feel shame, nervous and embarrassment as a result. And I and that's the outcome I would love to see other people achieve and have. And the thing is, is it's still a process like I'm still growing. I still every right. I, mean, I work with a lot of sexual health educators and things and like everything that they post. I learn every single day a new way in which to view it, a different way in which to talk about it, different language to use, because that makes a big difference. The language that you're using, the way that you're communicating. Communication is huge for intimacy. I mean, it really is part and parcel for intimacy and sexual intimacy, like all of it. So how can you, yeah. how can you have intimacy? Just the word itself. How can you have any form of intimacy without <laughs> communication? Right. I mean, well, wouldn't you say, you know, it's contingent? It's 100%, 100%. And I mean, yes, people are sexually active and sexually intimate, just physically intimate, I should right. say, with people right. without necessarily a whole strangers. lot of communication. Yeah, and and that yeah. sometimes is just for pleasure or validation or, you know, some, I mean, there's actually still a lot more that goes into it than just simply pleasure. Um, however, if you add in, I read somewhere too that intimacy is trust. And if you don't have trust, you can't be truly intimate with someone. But if so, you can't trust yourself. <laughs> and I think that's big, right? That's huge. So I had this conversation with this guy at Staples the other day. This guy was convinced that he was a sex addict. And I told him, I said, first of all, there's no such thing as a sex addict. There's no such thing as sex addiction. Um, when you, the American Psycholo Psychologist Association in um a whole bunch of authoritative bodies talking about this have determined that there is, is that no a such debatable thing. subject or that, that's just that's a fact. Not if you not if you consult all of these authoritative bodies. No, it used to be considered an, an yeah, actual yeah, yeah. issue, an actual addiction and whatever. And it's no longer considered a psychological problem. Now, what what I did state to him, though, is that you can be doing what the more I talked to him, he was worried about his risky behavior. Like he didn't trust himself. He would go to activities, events, clubs, and things like that. And then he'd take home random people regularly. And so he knew that he was putting himself at risk. He hadn't been recently tested. So he assumed that he probably had an STI, which probably wasn't a bad assumption because most people do anyways. And, um, and so I told him it wasn't that he's addicted to sex. It's that he's making choices that he doesn't feel good about at the end of the day, that, that he, there's something underlying there. There's an actual other concern, but it's, there's no such thing as it's truly a sabotage on, on that's just the way he sabotaged himself. Yeah. yeah. But is that some Antics, or is that not? I mean, if 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 somebody's going to call themselves a sex addict and that's how they identify it in order to get better, I mean, does it matter? I think the idea is that it, with calling it an addiction, that means that you can have too much. And you're saying there's no way that anybody could have too much sex.
No, I you like could the way you think. You could masturbate all damn day, and if it doesn't inter- in it, if it doesn't interfere and negatively harm you, then there's no such thing as too much. You can't have you can have too much alcohol, even if you have a career that lets you sit at home. Even even like mine, you know, like my my income is passive income. You know, I don't necessarily have to be working in order for income to happen with ad sales and stuff like that. So technically, yeah, I could sit around and drink all day, but it's going to harm me. I'm going to end up. Um, I could, okay, I could overdose. So you can't overdose on sex. You can't have too much sex. There is no such thing. You can have too many fries from McDonald's. You can cripple and you yourself, can... but you know, that's all another thing. Right. <laughs> I mean, you really can't, you can't have too many orgasms. You can't have too much pleasure. So I think, yeah, labeling it sometimes language and labels. I get that that may be the way in which somebody is trying to describe that they're doing things that are risky and problematic. And then it's, it's not the actual sex, the activity, it's how are the ways in which they're going about doing it and why they're going about doing it in that way, based on either a lack of empowerment to be able to discern, like, I'm not going to engage in activities unless we're using barriers, or I'm always going to get tested before and after each new partner. They're just choosing not to use sex, safer sex practices, or maybe they're lying and cheating. You know, there's, there probably very much is some other things that are problematic, but that's not the actual sex, sex itself. It's not that they're addicted to sex, it's that they're doing things that are putting them at risk. And it wouldn't even have to be sex involved necessarily. So yeah, I guess that would be, that's the way in which I would say is like, you can't have too much sex. It can't hurt you. I mean, yeah, the sex itself. But you know, the, for, for how I see the definition of addiction or alcoholism is when you're doing it to the point where your life becomes unmanageable due to it. So if you're, if, if sex is in the way from, you know, really what, like, it's, it's it's really easy for us as people to say, you know what I really want to be? I, I really want to be a major league baseball player. Well, at, at 58, that doesn't make sense. Mm-hmm. So, you, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's a, a mind game, right? So there's somebody else that might be 19 and say, you know what I really want to be? A major league baseball player. Yeah? Do you want to get in the batting cage every day? Do you want to run sprints all morning? Do you want to do all this work that's required to compete on that level? Because if the action's not there, the thought is a lie, right? It, it's we perceive there's that like when it comes to PTSD too, people can perceive, carry these messages through life. It's the wrong perception. If somebody tells you you're not, they scold you when you're like five and you just receive that message the wrong way or, or if somebody abandons you, uh, it, it's not always as dramatic as we see it as a child. Like, you know, we can interpret something improperly, but by not being able to share it, by not being able to be just honest about what it is, it just, it's like a cancer within you that just grows and grows. Next thing you know, you're 40 something and you're still dealing with abandonment issues. You wonder why you can't have a relationship, you know, it just snowballs into, and and like these little antlers come out into all these other areas of your life. And, And, you know, I think addiction personally is a symptom, but... I identify it as that. I mean, nobody really wants to wake up and stick needles in their arms and smoke crack till and st- do all the things that, you know, that come with being an addict, you know? Right. And it's not the dream as a kid to grow up and be that loser, you know? But there you are in the middle of it, you know? And it's just like, you know, there's a reason why you do it. And that's the problem. But right, right now the train's off the tracks. So the first thing we need to do is get the train back on the tracks. And they get the train rolling a little bit. Then you might want to, when you're secure in that, then you might want to find out what's going on behind it. But first you got to, you know, fix the, uh, put a Band-Aid on what's bleeding right now. Well, and you made an excellent point. The reason why we do it, like that goes back to that professor who I used to be on the radio show with. And he said, nobody has ever asked the reason why they're having sex and yeah. why they're having sex with whom and when and whatever. And sometimes it'll stop people and not that it's supposed to, or sometimes it encourages them to continue or to seek additional, whatever it is that they're interested in. Um, but if, when we're talking about something like a supposed sex addiction and you ask somebody, well, what's the reason why they're doing it? And you really have to, they have to stop and kind of assess what is the cause? What is the symptom? I mean, or it, that's a symptom of an underlying 
if they're doing risky behavior and they're not happy with the with the results of this activity, then obviously there's something else going on. And that's where that question that question comes into play and not blaming. We talked about that a little bit earlier about blame and how it's so easy for us to want to point a finger. And I think with trauma, especially this is really hard and I can only speak to my own experience, but when when you experience trauma and then you do some things as a result, like I I also kind of went off the rails for a while with drugs and alcohol, and um, in some ways it's still some things that I battle with. They're how I cope with trauma and bad feelings and bad emotions. But part of that is how I assess blame and how I decide not to point yeah. the finger and not to blame. Like a lot of people with STIs, immediately they're like. Who gave it to me and it's right. their fault because they didn't disclose and it's like well as long if it was a consensual activity there was risk there you involved yourself in some level of risk and yes of course it's ethical for someone who knows they have an sti to disclose but you're also assuming some risk and responsibility when you choose to engage yeah, in you're activities also assuming that people are ethical <laughs> right which Let's is wake also, up. which is it's silly to assume that makes an ass out of you and me right, right. You know? <laughs> yes felix unger I like this. Uh, somebody also said, I'd love to be able to claim this as my own, but it's not, that um, ha however someone feels as a result of trauma, as a result of like you were talking about childhood and how we can just perpetuate that over and over and over again, and that can become the fabric of our entire life based on these experiences. And that is so true for so many people because our childhood experiences are often very traumatic and often play a giant part in how who we become as adults. So that said, though, how we feel about those experiences is real. We can feel however we want to feel, and there's nothing wrong with those feelings, but that doesn't necessarily make it the reality. Right. So how we Your feel is very real. Your truth may not real. be the truth. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. How you feel about it is okay and real and your feelings are real and you can have those emotions, even bad emotions, but it may not be the reality of actually what that means. And so again, to take it back to like STIs, like at the time, I mean, it was horrible for years and years and years. I was shamed by my medical practitioner, by friends, by family members. I've had people attack me left and right. Um, I don't so much anymore, but every once in a while I still get attacked. And for a long time, I identified with the way in which that they were characterizing me. Like, oh, yeah, well, this must mean I'm a slut and a whore and damaged goods and being punished by God, you know, back to the religion aspect. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. But the thing is, is it's like that actually wasn't the reality. It never impacted my sexual relationships. There was no single partner who ever wanted to not engage just because I had an STI, which isn't always everyone's experience. But I've had plenty of partners a who lot just about didn't you. care. Yeah. So it's like that wasn't the truth, you know, that wasn't the actual that was how I felt for a long while, but it wasn't really who I was and whatever. So I, I, one day I just was like, OK, this is dumb. <laughs> no, but <laughs> you know what you are? You, you know what you represent? You're like a fuck you to every one of them. Yes. You're like a yes. living, breathing, attractive fuck you to all of them yes oh yeah i mean and, and and every once in a while i do i'll get some stupid comment again and it's just like yeah it's none ignorance. of it's it's ignorance and none of it's original i mean every every <laughs> once in a blue <laughs> moon i get something funny somebody says a slur that i'm like oh that's cute i hadn't heard that before somebody called me a um a trash panda um online a little while back a trash my, you gotta a trash admit some, i agree with you some of these people are so creative in their slander it's like, how do you, f I never, yeah. Well, I, you know I, what a trash panda is slang for? No. A raccoon. Because <laughs> they're always in the trash and they're black and white, you know, and they oh, look kind of like yeah, a panda. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> I didn't, you know, at first I thought trash panda so was kind of funny. You, and then my okay, husband's forgive like, me here, that's but a I was raccoon. calling you a raccoon a slander then. Well, that's what I told my husband. I read it to my husband and he laughed. He's like, well, that was dumb. That's a raccoon. I was like, well, trash panda, I thought was kind of cute too. <laughs> like raccoon, trash, trash panda. Is panda. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's... I'm like, okay. That was, it just still gave me a giggle, you know, but most of the time it's the same tropes. It's the same repeated crap. And I'm just like, okay. I mean, every once in a blue moon, somebody comes up with something cute and original and unique. And I'm like, okay, that's a sick burn. Good job. How Good about... job.